It's my pleasure today to be talking to William Graves in the house of Robert Graves in Dea. We are, are surrounded by beauty and also the most amazing amount of um, recent history, which William, I'm sure, is going to tell us all about. But William, welcome. Thank you very much. Tell us, um, now I believe that uh, Robert Graves lived in this house where we're sitting on this wonderful terrace for 52 years of his life. I'll have to work that out. He came here on, on to the island in 1929. He built the, uh, the house in 1932, I guess moved in in 1933, left at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War in 1936, and I came back with him and his new family in 1946, and he remained here from 1946 to 1985, that uh, was when he died, um, in this house. So you, you came back with him um, at that time. So where had you been before that then? Where was your life pr prior to here? Well, it was a, a very young life. Uh, I was born in 1940 during the Battle of Britain. I was born in Devon. Went to kindergarten and sort of primary school in, in, uh, near Brixham, a little village near Brixham, just down the road from Agatha Christie, who also lived around there, and uh, in whose house I misbehaved, and that's another story. <laughs> And uh, then at the end of the Second World War, my father sent my half-sister Jenny over here to check whether um, it was possible to come back in. She came here. She, she wrote to saying, Father, you can come back. Your pen, all your papers are just as you left it. So in the next uh, three or four months, we came back, took an ex-RAF plane it was called hunting services with the, with the uh, was the, uh, the the company that ran it and it took us th two days to fly down here and we were the first civilian aircraft to land on the island after the war two days where'd you go where have you been where have you been with this in this two days well we didn't go around in, <laughs> flying around in circles no we landed we left from Croydon airport landed at um, Wren where he had friends and where he had lived um, during his time away from Mallorca in 1938. Then um, we flew from Rennes down to Toulouse. In Toulouse, we, uh, we had to get permission to fly into Spain. However, the pilot was a chap called Bleb, Captain Bleb, who had actually flown Franco from the Canary Islands to, the, to Morocco, where, where before he started his... Uh, his um, uh, civil war, basically, and uh, and had, was it, had, a, had a good record with, with the Franco regime. So we were let in uh, with no problem, and then we flew down to Barcelona, and then from Barcelona we had to get permission to fly to Palma, and we arrived on the afternoon of the May 26th, 1946. So that's uh, five landings and five and five takeoffs to get here. Fantastic. But the, uh, the idea that um, you could get into Mallorca because of who you knew, nothing much has changed, has it? Well, it's always good to know, know the dictator, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think to know the dictator is probably a, a very useful thing, yes, indeed. But how was your, your father's arrival back here greeted at that time? Well, the whole... well. People came out from Palma to the airport to actually see us arrive. We were met by the chap that had looked after the house for 10 years here in Dea. When we arrived, we, he, he drove us up here, and um, it's about an hour, hour, an hour and a half's drive from the airport in those days. It was a little, little sort of uh, uh, dirt um, runway. The whole village was here to, to, to welcome us. So we came back to the house, and, uh, you know, I... I was five and a half, five and three quarters. I had a great time, and then we went to have supper, and other people came in and sort of kissed him and all the rest of it, and we took it from there. So so you arrived with, with your father, and, and who else then? Did you have other brothers and sisters that came back at that time with you? Yes. Um, to, to recap a little bit, um, his, Robert's first wife, was Nancy Nicholson, with whom he had uh, four children, and Jenny, who I mentioned, was the eldest. Uh, and my brother 
David, who was killed in the war in Robert's regiment in Burma, and two more brothers, a, a, a sister and a brother. And um, then an American poet called Laura Riding came on the scene, and they collaborated and uh, sort of had a threesome and then a foursome and men out of trois and all uh, uh, and uh, Laura Riding decided to jump out of the window, and uh, we call that the defenestration. Uh, and of course, that was suicide. So we had th they had to leave England. Uh, they met Gertrude Stein in Paris, whom they'd published a book for. And, and Gertrude Stein said, um, who had been here before the war, said, "If you, if uh, Mallorca is paradise, if you can stand it, meaning uh, it's paradise if you can sit down and work and not sit around in a cafe." Uh, which most people do still do nowadays. So anyway, I think that's the recap. Okay, and then um, and then eventually they had to leave at the beginning of the first uh, the, of the Second World War. Um, he and Laura and uh, a couple of acolytes that he had their hands hanging on. They went back to England, then s spent some time in France. And Rennes was one of the places. That's where we where we landed. And then uh, Robert was having better reviews than Laura, because Laura was also a poet. And then she decided she'd had enough of this and she was going back to America. So they all went back to America. Um, she fell in love with the person they were staying with, uh, dropped Robert, and uh, Robert came back to England, met my mother, Beryl, uh, and I was conceived and then born in Devon. So that's my life history until I got born. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK, so this is all becoming much clearer. So did Beryl come back with you here then? So on the aeroplane was well, the, well, the, was the pilot, co-pilot, uh, Robert, Beryl, Lucia, Juan and myself. I'm the eldest, then comes Lucia, and then comes Juan. And I have a younger brother who's called Tomas, who um, was born um, in 1953, uh, already on the island. Right, so uh, it was just a, a family relocation, just like many people are doing today then, except that you already had a house and a life and a reputation established before, before you came, before you arrived here. Your family did anyway. It's a little bit more complicated because Robert couldn't get a divorce. Uh, <laughs> so they couldn't, Robert and Beryl couldn't get married. So Beryl changed her name by deed poll to Graves. So therefore, they came in as Mr. and Mrs. Graves into Spain. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been allowed in. No, that's right. <laughs> so how did that ever get regularised? They got married in the British consulate here in Palma. Uh, Ivan Lake was the, uh, was the consul. They got married in 51. And they, uh, the res wedding reception was on a wonderful ex-torpedo mothership, uh, an ex-submarine mothership called the, Ros the Rosalind. It was when the, in the Club de Mar in Palma. Yeah, yeah. So how old are you at this stage then? So you're a teenager then, by then? Uh, when they were married, yes. I, I was, I'm on the bastard line until I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a unique place to occupy? <laughs> no, uh, no, because Lucia and June were also on the bastard line. Tomas is already uh, a, a bona fide... Uh, <laughs> so, to so Thomas was okay, but you three, did you go to the local Catholic school? And, did you, and was this questioned here when you were in Dea? No, because our, our name was Graves. There was, there was no way to, to question, nothing to question. And they weren't going to show the papers, were they? <laughs> so so, when you, so you, you settled here then, and your life took... I mean, it, ha it can't really be normal with all that background, but you did go to school and you did exist in a day-to-day in a -day way like any other family, I presume. Not like any other family, because this, the house was English, and we had all the English... Um, uh, you know, you sat at the table. We had George and Silver. Uh, we had, um, you know, George and Candlesticks, uh, Mallorcan furniture. Um, we had the press, first pressure cooker in Mallorca, I guess. Uh, <laughs> things like that. But on the other hand, I had my village friends because I went to the village school. And uh, we used to... Um, I wrote a little book called Wild Olives, which I might as well plug here, which you can still get on, on, in, on, uh, on, uh, on Amazon. And um, but we used to I used to go with them. We used to cat, take catch frogs from the from the little 
the the the, the water reservoirs and put straws up there behind and blow them up and uh, and take <laughs> and take uh, take cats and tie um, uh, tin cans to their tails things that village boys do but then came here came back to the house and stroked our cats and caressed them and listened to to, to Dick Barton special agent on the wireless as they were called in those days. On the wireless. So what wireless did you have then? You had a, a wind-up world service. No, no, in those days, it was, it was no world service in those days. It was just, it was the BBC. Like we got, uh, we got BB, uh, BBC home service and I guess light programme, if, if that was there. But uh, did you need electricity for that? We had an electric um, generator, which Robert bought the village, which is here in the garden, which you can see if you come to visit it. It was about, I forgot how many uh, watts, it was about just a, what, whatever it took to, to run the, a valve radio. The water, the, the light was very dim. We sort of had about 30, uh, you know, 25 amp um, watt bulbs and things like that. But we could, you know, it was enough to, to listen to the radio. The, I mean, there's apocryphal stories about electricity in Dea, and it always comes back to your father, how the generosity of your father allowed this village in the mountains to have electricity supply when the rest of Mallorca didn't. Uh, and twice, twice over, because we had the, uh, they had this generator which was run by a, by a waterfall. It, 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 had been a, it had been a flour mill, so he just put a turbine on it and... and uh, and ran it, and there about there were kind of more than about five or five or ten houses with it, with, with electricity. And it was it wasn't uh, altruism. He needed he wanted to be able to work at night, so he had enough work so he didn't have to work with a candle, by candlelight. He could actually work by by electric light. And uh, and as as the village grew, of course the the uh, the, the poor little generator, which is a <laughs> tiny little thing in the garden, just couldn't manage and. Uh, they then tried to get to, to link up with the um, with the mains, and there was a lady, a, a countess in um, in Valdemosa, who wouldn't ha allow the the the, 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 um, the pylon, the electric pylon, to be put on her land. And eventually, Robert, um, because he had uh, he knew Fraga, who was the uh, the minister of education and tourism in those days, who had actually come to visit him here. Well, that, well, that's another story. And he said, you know, what can you do about it? And uh, he sorted it out, and we had electricity in 1963. So, but we didn't actually have mains electricity until 1963. Mm, that's fantastic. But I'm, I'm just trying to get my picture here. I'm in this idyllic spot where you've got Georgian silver and you've got wonderful tablecloths, I'm sure, and you're, you're running a, a very almost aristocratic English house in the middle of Dea where everyone else is actually either scrabbling for a living if they were local or living on the GI Bill if they weren't? Well, it's hardly a mansion. It's a, it's a, it's a village house. All the houses, all, all the rooms are small. We've got, we, had three, um, we had three studies when the house was built and a press room, say where the press was installed. Two of the studies were made into bedrooms and uh, the press room remained sort of as a, as a library. Uh, and then we had just a couple of, but just just a small bathroom and a, and a toilet. That was that's all there was. Uh, but there was little England in many other respects, though. To a certain extent, we got we got the uh, the Overseas Times, which came in sort of very thin uh, airmail paper, in, wrapped in a blue in a blue thing, which yes. some old timers remember, <laughs> and which we then used to wrap our our oranges in the in the uh, you know when we had too many, we we crated out the oranges mm -hmm. and wrapped them in the in the Times. So, so how, do you, how do you live as a child or a teenager in, in the uh, overwhelming force that was your father and the way that his life happened here? I mean, where did the kids come in? Did you just have a great time or was it difficult? Uh, it, it was difficult. It was difficult and we, and we weren't allowed to make any noise. Uh, so much so that we had a wind-up gramophone uh, which, had the, which had the steel needles and um, the, um, to, to, to reduce the noise, I, I used to take um, rose thorns and stick them in the needle and play the, the 78 records with this thing so that you could just hear it if you put your, your, your head near the thing. That was, that was how we listened to, to, to when, when he was working. We weren't allowed to make any noise at all. 
Well, how did how did that work then? Did you just spend most of your time away from the house? As far away as possible, yes. <laughs> until until uh, in the afternoons, uh, you know. He, so he he started right. He went to get his post. He always went down for a, for a swim. So you know, that, then we could sort of more or less. Uh, uh, but you know, you had to be careful. If he, if he was working, he just didn't make any noise. And what happened if you did make a noise then? You got a clatter on your on your. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least at least got a got a good bollocking. Yeah, yeah. And so so your life then. So did you ha- did you create your own world here then? Well, I had my world in the village. You know, I used to go go with the, with the boys, go down fishing or down to the beach, and uh, um, and then of course when we were in Palma, I had my, my own friends in Palma, and, and as I grew up, we had a whole group of people here that used to come in summers, and we went down to Palma for my, for the education. You know, so it's it was it was all right. It was, uh, you know, you get, you get to live, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> well, when you're, when you're a child and you have no, no control over... Because other people are controlling what you do, then you live within their, within their confines. But when you were able to say, thanks very much, Dad, I'm off now, what did you do? I got... My, well, <coughs> the, well, the first thing I did is when, when I... OK, at, at the age of 14, I was sent off to public school. Uh, I'd had a, a, a tutor, half-tutor, um, first in Dea, the first tutor was called William uh, Bill Merwin, and one of uh, my mother's um, college friends came here. It was called Eileen uh, Isabel Hawking. Sorry, Eileen it was her, was our nickname for her, Isabel Hawking, who was Stephen Hawking's mother, and <gasps> he came. Here, she came here with her her children, and, and, and Stephen was, uh, shared, his, shared my tutor with me. So I was tutored with, with, uh, with Stephen Hawking, and, uh, and, uh, and that actually was really quite a problem for me, because all Stephen could speak was English, and of course all my, all my contemporaries were my and I'd go down to the village, and, and it was very embarrassing to have this, this, this English person that didn't understand anything, and all, all or he didn't understand about about sort of uh, catching catching thrushes in nets and and fishing and all the sort of things that people did then, and, and the sort of the agricultural cycle. It, it was embarrassing for me. In fact, it was embarrassing for me if I'm playing with my kids and uh, my my friends. And Robert came down to, to to fetch me back for lunch or something, and you know he, he called to me he called, called out to me in English, and I sort of scurry away so he didn't you know so that I could I could sort of come round round the back way and talk English to him without the, the village boys knowing so I had I, I was living sort of a double life in a way so you were embarrassed by n- not his fame but just the fact that he couldn't speak my king exactly mm. absolutely and Stephen <laughs> Hawkins in your living memory is a disappointment to you because absolutely. he couldn't speak my king yeah, uh, well yeah, uh, no he was he was interesting he liked he liked sort of letting off stink bombs and things like that you know <laughs> <laughs> How long did he live here then? Only about three months. He was here about three months. But then, uh, you know, I've, I've kept, kept in touch with the family and uh, yeah. he mentions me in his book. <laughs> <laughs> of this idyllic summer when, when he was, uh, yeah, yeah, he became he the friend that... He wasn't very impressed with, with, with William Merwin, Bill Merwin. And then after that, I went to move down to Palma and my, uh, my tutor was Martin Seymour Smith, who wrote a, he, he wrote a biography of Roberts. He came here... And and generally it was someone walked into the walked through the door and they'd find a use for him. And, and when Martin walked into the door, well, I, he became my tutor. But the per- person that was actually came here to do something was his wife, his future wife, uh, Janet Grenville, de Grenville, who was had just done great at Oxford and helped Robert with 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 his uh, Greek myths. So that was the so, reason. So, so it was life here was very much whoever walked into the door was sort of put to to to, to use sort of thing. And and did you have um, a pilgrimage of people coming to vi- to visit your father? Uh, that started later on. You know, it started when uh, say in the m- mid late fifties. But you know, we've had people like we had people like uh, Ray Fawn Williams who came came to visit us when we were in Palma. I was fascinated by him. He had a, a, a wonderful Bakelite hearing aid. I wasn't slightly bit interested, and in, I didn't know who he was yeah. as a child. But his hearing aid was what really impressed me. And his music. <laughs> and his music. Then, when I was sent to to, to public school, then I realised who he who was. It was. <laughs> but yeah. you know, as a child, I had no idea. Yeah. You know, Robert was was just my father. That was it. 
And all the people that were living here at the time, I mean, when, when you read the books of that, of, the, of that moment, I mean, you were sharing your space in the universe here with some incredibly, well, incredibly clever and artistic people. I mean, there's a whole era that you lived through, but did, that, did they matter much to you? Uh, it depended. Um, I suppose from the age of 10, you started, so it's 1950, you started getting XGIs coming here. Um, or else people sent by friends in America. We had some, a chap called Tom Metcalf who was, uh, had won the Biennale in, in, um, in Sao Paulo in 1949 or something and who was, who was blacklisted as a communist by, uh, by the Americans. So he had to, he had to live, live outside of um, things like that. You know, and we had sort of boat people again who were friends. There was a guy called Janine West and who used to get us our our butane because we could, you couldn't get butane but we had our first uh, we had a, a, a butane uh, fridge so you know that was brilliant having that so there's, there's this there is a, a, a good connection with 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 the boat uh, the boat community as well and uh, another um, person was was the uh, the person who had the Rosalind who was uh, had been an ex submariner uh, Cyril Morrison uh, who used to charter boats in in in, the, in at that early time in in, the, in in Palma, so you know with the, we we always had a, a good connection with the um, with the club now. And of course, next to the the, the Rosalind was was the uh, the, the Thaka, Errol Flynn's boat mm. was there. <laughs> so you know there was there was a lot of you know there was that period of time when, when things were happening here, and Errol Flynn's wife used to go to ballet school with with Nadil, Nadine Gorham, I think. No, Nadine, I've got my name is. Uh, and then my sister went to ballet school with, with Ina Janssen, who was the other ballet teacher in Palma. So there's all this thing going on at the same time. Well, you had you had whatever was going on in Dea, when particularly with the Americans and the GI Bill. Thank you to the Americans that sent us all there, <laughs> sent all this talent over here. But you know, at the same time in the Terreno and the places around Palma, you were having uh, you were just being visited by everybody. I mean, this this place should have been the centre of the universe, and I think probably for a while it was. Well, in in Terreno, of course. No, Terreno lived its own life. Yeah. You had Larry's Bar. And everyone used to meet at Larry's Bar, and there was um, uh, Robert Creeley and people like that was there, and uh, it was it was another. Com- but Robert had no time, you know. Mallorca was paradise for him because he could work. We had nothing to do with that that whole world, apart from there was a uh, a pre-war painter called William um, William Cook, who was who had been a friend of Gertrude Stein. And uh, so there was a connection still with Gertrude Stein after the war. And then there were some Americans called uh, Cicely Foster and Archie Gittes. He was an American Jew. She was an English uh, concert pianist. And they lived here in Dea during the war. In fact, they stayed right through the war. And there was some other, other another English lady who stayed here during the war. But basically, Roberts kept a very small circle. When you live, you lived here, and it's probably only as you've got older and look back on it all that you realise the significance of the of the era that you lived in at that time. When Robert died in 1985, um, a, a lot of biographies had already been written, so I I wrote my book to put to set things right, <laughs> so to speak, and uh, and that sort of sort of gives a more appropriate vision of the uh, of what life was like and in fact when when my mother read it said yes that's how it was hmm. well, she hadn't read yeah, it yet that's <laughs> the, yeah that, that's the <laughs> accolade and, and you need of course, yeah. but anyway but so, we, we've got to go back now because yes. uh, when we went, before we went off on this literary journey can, we uh, we've only got to you being 14 and being sent off to school so what happened to you then okay i went went to school bottom of the class to start off with were you in the uk i was at a public school in england called arundel near peterborough um, I was sent there because um, a broadcast called Cabby Marshall was the housemaster. Of course, he left the term I arrived. Uh, but one of my, uh, one of the other boys at the, at, in the, he was already in the sixth form, was George Sassoon, who was Siegfried Sassoon's son. And of course, Siegfried Sassoon and Robert had, had both fought in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. 
So they had this, um, in fact, uh, Robert and Siegfried met in front of their of my housemaster's study for the first time <laughs> since the well since since he left England in, in 1929. So there's that little bit, and you know slowly I, I sort of got Englished, if you like, <laughs> learnt uh, what uh, silly mid on and, and a few things like that meant. Actually, I don't. I still. I can't remember what they mean now <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but you learnt to, and uh, you learnt you learnt what you know. Um, uh, and of course, I had to, I had to learn the uh, the names of all the, the English footballers and people like that. You know, all, I was I was thrown into a complete new culture. You know, culture. I was I was you know, I was like someone coming out of uh, out of you know where Addis Ababa or somewhere like that, and not knowing what the hell was going on. But slowly, I built up, which allowed me to leave leave, a, leave live more or less a normal life, and, and I, I managed to get out of of school with. Uh, with five A levels, which is not bad. Of course, one of them was a mechanical drawing, uh, but I, I decided to go up the science side because you can't, you can't follow the Graves Act, the Robert Graves Act. So, I decided to become a scientist and uh, took geology, got an honours degree at Imperial College London, and uh, worked. I, when I worked in the oil business, oil industry, all my life, apart from uh, the five years when I got married in 1966 with Elena, 1965 and um, ran a hotel for five years. But uh, it was very useful, and I, I continued working through the thing, and then uh, went and worked full-time as a consultant in, my, in, the, in the oil business until I retired at the age of 68. So your travels with the oil business then presumably took you all over the world, did you? Uh, always within flying distance of my you know, day, uh, because this was always my base. Uh, or wherever my wife and and, and uh, I have a son and a daughter, wherever they were, that was our base. And you know, then we when we moved, uh, they started off in Dea. We had a house in Dea. Then we moved to Palma, and spent about five years there. And then they went to the uh, the, the Jesuits and the Sacred Heart. And we thought that was maybe not uh, too wise. Uh, they were very young and. Uh, uh, they found religion. Though, they, they didn't actually find religion and. Uh, couldn't quite understand what it was all about, but we, uh, when uh, Philip had to do his first communion, we gave him a watch anyway, <laughs> and that that satisfied him. And then uh, and then we moved to Madrid, uh, and they spent uh, five years there. And then uh, uh, Philip went to his fi- sixth form um, education in in Uppingham, and uh, then uh, Imperial College. He's he's a mining engineer by by degree and eventually got an MBA. And my daughter is, uh, might as well go on this, off on this tangent. Uh, and my daughter then went to King's and did ed- math and education as a special needs teacher and has been a special needs teacher ever since. So that's the family. Uh, <laughs> but you say that Mallorca has always been your base. So do your children regard that as their base or are they settled in elsewhere now? They're, they're settled in England, in Putney. And uh, but this is still their, you know, their home. Unfortunately, the children always find their home and always have their own bedroom when they come back home, even even when they get to fifty. <laughs> but, Can you tell me um, a little of your relationship as you got older with your father? Well, everything was fine, and in fact, uh, you know, I was um, one of my most pleasant memories when I was working in Greece in the oil business and he was he was asked to introduce a uh, the um, uh, an, uh, that standard in New Jersey that the oil company was doing a, uh, a heritage uh, series and he was invited to introduce the the, the, um, the Greek tragedies uh, in in Delphi uh, so I was actually working in Greece so I managed to go and watch the filming of that which is a and I have, I still have the, uh, the, the 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 film of that. But um, I was in very good terms with him. Um, but he was already beginning to move, lose his memory at that stage. It's like it, it started very early on. But uh, I was, I got interested in archaeology. So uh, he said, "Why don't you go to Oxford and do archaeology?" So I went to Oxford to do archaeology, uh, and um, so I left the oil business. Uh, for a little bit, and um, then found someone else had written the same thesis. Uh, in fact, I, I'd, I'd got interested in archaeology also because 
Bill Waldron was here in the in the village, and I I used to do digs with him. So and I was going to do an uh, um, um, my my thesis on the Bronze Age in, in, in the Balearics that had been written. So I said the hell with it, and uh, I had a, a rather expensive French girlfriend at the time. So and uh, you know I, I found. Oxford at that stage was a bit puerile, uh, having to have a green light on my car. Uh, so I came back here and then met met Elena and uh, and that. So that then you know that my uh, my love life changed. And uh, tell us about Elena. She's Spanish, isn't she? She's Spanish. Um, I met her at the Club Nautico in Palma. A friend of mine, her, his father was the Commodore Commodoro. In, in the Club Nautico and uh, they were arranging a Christmas dinner a New Year's Eve dinner and uh, his son had several tickets for the dinner and said why don't you come along a friend of mine and Elena had been asked to come along and uh, I sat next to her I had another girlfriend at the time and I sat next to her uh, she was wearing a I always remember a sort of a Chinese uh, uh, silk dress, very short silk dress. Her brother-in-law had actually been a, one of the flying tigers in uh, Taiwan, I guess, and uh, had been Chiang Kai-shek's private pilot. Had, had one, been one of the original flying, flying set up the flying tigers. So hence the, the, the Chinese dress. And uh, Elena was living with, with Steve. Anyway, we we danced together. She was smoking a Havana cigar. You know, it's always a good. <laughs> as you do, <laughs> as you do at Christmas parties. And um, so, you know, she, <laughs> anyway, um, so I went back to Oxford. Continued to. I was still doing my 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 archaeology, and uh, I gave that whole up as a bad job. Came back here, and then we met up, and uh, we've been living together ever since. Ah, the rest is the rest, the rest is, is, uh, is is the rest of my life. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Ah, lovely. I, I need to, to, to bring you back here. I mean, would you say that you're a terribly respectable Englishman now? No, I'm not sure I'm respectable. But still, there we go. I can, I, I can play the Englishman, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is the yeah. same thing. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> I understand playing the Englishman or the wild card or the bohemian or the, um, the day fix for being hedonistic. I mean, where, where do you fit in all that lot? Well, okay. Um, I was here in the 1960s. Uh, the drug scene arrived here. Everyone was, you know, you went to a party and you were offered a joint. And I have never tried anything. I've never smoked anything more than a cigarillo until I got um, uh, a bad cough and the doctor said, stop smoking. So I, I even stopped that. Um, what you mean, the, the, the scene, the drugs and sex scene passed you by here? I won't say the sex passed me by, but the drugs passed me by. <laughs> and uh, and I've, I've always been anti anything that, that uh, you know, influence. I, I guess it's, it's being a scientist. I just like, just like to keep my, my head and know exactly what's happening. Although I have to admit that every once in a while, uh, too much jip. Because we used to play the guitar and, and on, in, the, in, a, in a bar in Palma with some friends of mine and, and got paid with... Uh, with, 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 I think, with little shots of shots. gin. So every once in a while, you wonder how you drove back today. But, you know... Um, Have you kind of um, reacted against your father's life then, in the sense of, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of catalogued and well-known about the different relationships and the muse that, the muses that uh, influenced him? I stood up for my mother. And um, when... When it was just, you know, obviously it was just he was going off his head, and we all knew that. And uh, that's, but when it started, that um, in fact, okay, he had various um, so-called muses who he wrote poetry to. He had a, a, a prostate operation in 1958, so I don't think there's very much going on after that. So, but uh, you know, he, he might have. But anyway, so you know, it wasn't it wasn't that serious. <laughs> Uh, it was cerebral, but, darling, then, was it cerebral? Whatever, whatever. But anyway, it helped his poetry, and that was the main thing. He, he got to this, his, his brain. He, he couldn't write any, any novels or anything like that. So it was everything. It was fairly short, I think, and his poetry. And he needed his poetry, and he needed that to keep himself sane. Well, fine. Uh, 
okay, this is me rationalizing. I wasn't rationalizing earlier on because I didn't could I think I didn't have the perspective. However, um, one day with one of his muses, he wanted me to drive him down, Elena and I, to drive him down uh, because he'd been invited by um, Peter Ustinov, who was in, in Puerto Solier with his, with his boat. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm driving you down, but with Beryl, not with this other one. And that was kind of a turning point. Um, How was your mother doing with all this then? Well, um, stiff upper lip, but lots of migraines. Tremendous stress. And uh, it was only when uh, the... Um, basically, well, you know, he, 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 lost, he was very badly injured during the Somme. Uh, we haven't mentioned this, but of course he was in... He was a, 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 a fort in the Somme, badly injured... Uh, was left was in a coma for over. You know, he was left. He, he had, they did the triage. Oh, this one's not going to survive. Put him in a corner, lay him on a stretcher. It left him on the stretcher. They found him. Up. He he woke up from his um, from his. Uh, he was in a, in a, in a coma. Uh, woke up. Oh, Graves is still living. You know, we better take him down to the to the hospital. That was part of what happened. You know, part of his uh, his dementia. I think started his dementia. The second thing is he had Spanish flu, so when uh, he was taken to Harley Street to see how he was, because Bell realized he was losing his thing, and um, they they did this the, the knee test. You know, if if you if you if you if your your knee um, uh, your 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 foot comes up, you're okay. If it goes down, you have some brain damage. He already had da brain damage in 1966, so you know it. You know, it this was sort of thing, but. Uh, and by 1970, she was starting to answer his letters. By 1975, he was no longer writing, and he lasted until 1985. So there was a long, long period uh, where he was... And in his later day, later years, his shell shock, because he was very, very badly shell shocked when he, when he first got married. And the shell shock came back, and when he was in a wheelchair, and he was sort of... Uh, he sort of, uh, it was some sort of noise, he started pointing at, you know, you could see his, his terror in his eyes. So he never got cured of his shell shock. He lived with it all his life. Um, he didn't have the horrors that he had uh, when he was first injured, but slowly, you know, it, it, it came back to him. So, William, we're talking really about the tortured brilliance of your father, and there's, it's a typical story in some ways that people were just so affected by the the war influences that you it's only in retrospect you can see exactly what formed them but in all the brilliance and in all the the words and in all the all the his legacy that he's left i mean you you have now come into this legacy and you are taking his memory forward in this place tell us about the house and now how it's a museum and how people can come and see for themselves where it all happened well, OK, the legacy starts, actually, when, 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 when we read his will. And my sister's all, all, always, you know, been the writer and that sort of thing. And, uh, and uh, my brother, uh, Thomas, had been to London School of Printing, so he was in printing. I was just a geologist. And then suddenly I find I am his, his, his executor. You now, didn't know? You didn't know I that. didn't know I was going to be his executor. But this is just, it was just for the will. Right. But, of course, he named no literary executor. So... I was, I just took on being the literary executor. So it meant, that, okay, the first thing I had to do was set up, okay, his, his royalties and who, who you know, how, how was that dealt with? So I sort set it all that, set up a trust. So all the monies went to the trust. Uh, that's, okay, that's fine. And uh, okay, uh, and then someone said, well, you know, uh, and I started looking at where all his papers were. And um, I went, there was a, a thing called the, uh, Register of English Letters and Manuscripts in Reading. So I went down to Reading to look at that, see what they had of Roberts. And I met the one of the people on the board of the Samuel Beckett Trust. I said, Samuel Beckett Trust? Well, we need a Robert Grace Trust. So I set up a Robert Grace Trust at Oxford. So there's a St John's College Robert Grace Trust uh, to, to, gather, to gather together all of his papers. And in fact, that's where all his papers, all the, all the, all his library 
all his working life and all his papers were in this house and now at St. John's. We had, we had a, uh, um, a centenary conference at Oxford. We had a centenary conference here in Palma. We had a, a big exhibition in La Longa in this beautiful thing in Palma in 1995. And we decided we should have a Robert Gray Society. Uh, so we had a Robert Gray Society. And then we started having uh, international conferences. I'm just back from a conference in Oxford, Robert Gray's in the First World War, at which we have we had two tremendous people, you know, talking about um, military people. So we've got the military in, in there and, and all about uh, post-traumatic stress and shell shock and all the rest of it. Uh, in, this, in this conference, I've also presented my latest project, which is, which is transcribing all his letters uh, written, he wrote during the First World War, which is now online. We have a, a Robert Graves lecture once a year now. Uh, in a month, I'm going over to, to England at the Sitwell's house, uh, where we're having another conf another lecture. Um, but anyway, the conference has kept on going. My mother was here, uh, still living in the house. She put together his complete poems, um, made sure that all his books kept back in print. You know, um, he's in he's got his e-books are, are published everywhere worldwide. You can get them through. What do they call Rosetta books? Mm. Uh, if you want, to, if anyone wants to download them on board, now we're talking about uh, uh, to, to boat radio. Uh, they can be downloaded um, worldwide. And then in 19, sorry, in 2003, my mother died. Um, I've already already had the idea of sort of setting up a foundation here, but uh, the local government sort of came, so we want it. In fact, they, they actually came to us as, as we were lowering my mother's coffin into, coffin into her grave. It wasn't the most appropriate moment that we'll talk about it. So we set up this foundation. And the foundation was, was set up, the, the, the object of the foundation was to buy the house. And we opened in 19, uh, sorry, uh, in 2006, and we've been open ever since. Uh, we're open uh, summer and winter. La Casa de Robert Graves dot org is the website. No one knew anything about Robert Graves, and you know they, they they bought the house. They didn't know what to do with it, and I was on the board, and I'm the only person that knew anything about Robert Graves. So it is as I describe the house is as I remember it as a young boy. So I've got the old wireless where I listen to Dick Barton, special agent. I've got. The old, you know, the, the sort of coffee mill, the, the generators in the garden, everything that sort of ties in with the 1930s, 1940s. So everything is basically timed to that thing. All the electric light fixtures are original. Um, all the furniture is original. We, we, I put um, one of the studies that was, was made into a bedroom back to the way it was. I had photographs of everything. Um, I've got um, uh, the plan of the garden, so it shows that it actually was exactly as it was in the in the 30s, and uh, we get about 6,000 people a year, which is very nice. I, I know that we're winding up because, uh, but we'd love to talk to you again in another time. But just tell me, tell me just the, the the story of who is still looking for the Robert Graves story, the younger people. I mean, I can understand we, older people. We're and, getting. A lot of people now at the conferences that are looking at, uh, at Robert Gray's, people are interested in, in, uh, in shell shock. There's a new selection of, of Robert Gray's war poetry. I, the first thing I did as, a, as his literary executor was to, was to bring his war poems back into print, which he had f want, you know, wanted to forget about completely. In a second, he reckoned that, that goodbye to all that, which is which is uh, which was his memoirs at the age of 33, uh, covered the war, was enough to say goodbye to all that, and he 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 um, his war poetry, he also discarded. I put I, I brought the war poetry back in, into thing, so now uh, his and now a new volume of his war poems as they were originally uh, published. Uh, with everything, with, with all the uh, commentary is coming out. And we haven't even talked about I, Claudius. I mean, does that come into f feature anymore? Are people remember in their memories? A lot of people come in to, to I, Claudius to remember I, Claudius. And of course, it's, it's still shown. Still, people still remember it. And the BBC have the option for a new I, Claudius. So that, in the fullness of time, knowing how BBC works, 
uh, will will be produced, I hope. And otherwise, we'll just keep the option money, which is very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we can all do with a bit of an option money, can't we? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I, as I say, I'm reluctantly winding up this interview because we've, um, we, you know, we've come to just one particular stage. There's so much more that you can say, and I'm so grateful to you that you're, you've shared so openly with us exactly your life, and it's just been such a pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure, and uh, I hope we can be listened to worldwide.